Today's sermon is brought to us by Pastor Mike Moses. We hope that you are uplifted and encouraged by this wonderful sermon. Amen. Well, you can take your seats. It is a joy to be here with you today. I want to invite you to open up God's Word to the Gospel of John, chapter 4. The Gospel of John, chapter 4. We continue today in our uh, five week series, Worship in Spirit and in Truth. We began the series a few weeks ago by just focusing on the God whom we worship. And then Elder Bob instructed us in the heart of worship that God calls from us. Last week, we examined the elements of our gathering. Gathered worship as we come together each Sunday morning in praise and with preaching and with God's people. But of course, as we know, the Lord wants our worship not only on Sunday mornings, that he wants our worship every single day of our lives, that the Christian is called to a lifestyle of everyday worship worship. And so that's the title of our message today, Everyday Worship. And most of our time will be spent in Romans 12, 1 and 2, but I've asked you to turn to John 4 first for some important context leading into this scripture and specifically appreciating the proper location of our worship. I'm sure that if you took some time to consider, you could come up with some locations, some physical locations that are very special to you and to your life experience. As you look back over the course of your time, there are special events and moments that took place in your life that are linked with particular locations. For me, one of those very special locations is the town of Lake Orion, Michigan, just about an hour north of here in Oakland County. I spent about five years of my life in Lake Orion and just as I was finishing Bible college and beginning my grad school. And it was a very special location to me as I ministered at a church there and had lots of really wonderful friendships that continue to this day. I learned a lot about ministry and was mentored by some wonderful men there in Lake Orion. But even more importantly than all of those things, Lake Orion was the location where I met the young woman who would eventually become my wife. And so anytime I'm near Lake Orion, I'll go out of my way to, to drive past certain locations that were very special in the development of our relationship. I'll drive past a restaurant where we had one of our first dates. I'll uh, drive past a park where we would spend a lot of Saturday mornings walking together and talking and, and dreaming about our future together. I'll drive near the location where we got engaged. That is a particular location that is very, very special to me. Well, the Old Testament people of God had a location that was very, very special to them because it was the place where God had ordained for them to come and seek him and worship him together. And that very special location was the temple in Jerusalem. Over the centuries, they were primed to see that one particular location as the ultimate place of worship. But through Christ, that would change. And Jesus explains this in John 4 in his conversation with a woman at a well in Samaria. Notice verse 19 in the course of their conversation, the woman brings up a theological uh, question with regard to the proper location of worship. She says in John 4, 19, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. So here's my question, verse 20. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain. There was a mountain near where they were standing in Samaria that was an alternate place of worship for the Samaritan people. But she says, you say, as a Jew, you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain here in Samaria nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. Now, it is important to worship properly and according to the command of God, verse 22, you worship what you do not know, we worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews, but the hour is coming and in fact is now here, Jesus says, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth not linked to a particular location, but in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. 
Here's one of the primary imports of that important phrase, that through the work of Christ and by the omnipresent ministry of the Spirit, you and I can worship God anywhere, can worship God with our entire lives every single day of the week. This is our calling in Christ. I want to ask you to turn now to Romans chapter 12, where we will spend the majority of our time today in two wonderful verses, Romans 12, 1 and 2, that instruct us in what it means to worship Christ every single day. And point number one, the first thing we'll see in verse one is that everyday worship involves us, you and I, being living sacrifices. Notice verse 1 begins by an appeal to the brothers and sisters there in the city of Rome, an appeal that is based on something, the mercies of God. Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. Now, it's important for us to pause there because of his appeal in verses 1 and 2 are based on this phrase, mercies of God. We should understand what those mercies are. So you say, well, Pastor Mike, how might I understand these mercies of God upon which Paul's forthcoming appeal will be based? Well, all you have to do is to look at the first 11 chapters of Romans to see what these mercies of God are. Now, Now, I do wish we had time today to explore the first 11 chapters of Romans in depth. We do not have the time, but just to survey and review these mercies, Paul begins in chapters 1 and 2 by saying that we need mercy because we are lost in sin. That humanity stands under the righteous judgment of God because although his truth is evident in the things that he has been created, all of humanity, born in sin, has suppressed that truth and replaced it with lies and replaced it with worship of the created thing and of the self rather than of the creator. And this results in pagan living, wild lifestyles by those who don't profess God, but even those who do profess worship of the true God, still, apart from the grace of God, walk in hypocrisy. There is a religious facade, but there is not true heart worship. And so equally, Jew and Gentile, the religious hypocrite and the outright pagan, both are under sin and under the judgment of God. But his mercy comes in through the cross of Jesus Christ. He is put forward on the cross to show forgiveness to those who believe so that you and I, through Christ, might be fully justified, seen in God's sight as just, as righteous, and holy as perf- and perfect as Jesus himself. This happened through the cross. And chapter 4 says, this is received by faith and faith alone. And such wonderful benefits flow from this forgiveness and justification. Chapter 5, union with Christ. Chapter 6, freedom from sin. Chapter 7, freedom from the law. Chapter 8, assurance in the Spirit so that we may know that we are loved and kept by Him no matter how hard life may get. And all of this is due to the wise plan of the Father. Chapters 9 through 11. No one Wonder Paul finishes this section in the last verse of chapter 11 by saying from him and through him and to him are all things to him be glory forever. Amen. These are the mercies of God toward all who believe. And I want you to know today if you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ by faith then everything that Paul is about to say in chapter 12, everything I will be emphasizing in this message today cannot apply to you. Because we cannot worship God as living sacrifices. We cannot worship him every day of our lives unless we first are resting in the finished work of Christ. Unless we first have experienced the unmerited, undeserved mercy of Christ. And you can receive that today, right now. You can call out to God right there in your seat acknowledging your need, your guilt before him, all the ways that you have rebelled against his command, but thanking him for sending his son, Jesus Christ, to live the perfect life that you and I have failed to live, 
to die on the cross in our place for our sins and then rising from the grave three days later to win eternal life for all who believe. You can receive him today. You don't have to go on a pilgrimage to some particular location. The Father is drawing people to worship him in spirit and in truth from all kinds of locations, including the chair you are sitting in this morning receive Christ today and experience these mercies of God. And for those of you who have already received these mercies by faith, the Apostle Paul wants you to remember that because of those mercies, we owe him everything. Never forget that we were dead in trespasses and sins and he made us alive. Never forget that we were guilty, worthy of God's wrath and he forgave us fully. Never forget that we were rebels and he brought us into his family. Never forget that we were hopeless and lost and he gave us a future. And so in light of these incredible mercies, what then should be our response? Paul says our response should be a willingness to give everything we are to him. Notice it for yourself here in verse one. He says, on the basis of the mercies of Christ, I appeal to you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Now this metaphor of redeemed people being living sacrifices is a, a really vivid metaphor, is it not? Especially for people who were very familiar with that old covenant system of sacrifices. You can read throughout the Old Testament, particularly Leviticus and Numbers, and you can see in detail all that God instructed in that sacrificial system. And chapter upon chapter of detail regarding the things for which those sacrifices need to be made. And the proper times and locations of those sacrifices. And exactly how those sacrifices were to be administered by the priests in the temple and the proper animals that could be brought based on your socioeconomic status. Detail upon detail of these sacrifices. And each sacrifice was to be holy. Each sacrifice was to be acceptable. But the thing about a sacrifice is it ended up dead. And so here Paul says, the living sacrifice likewise should be holy, likewise should be acceptable to God, but is not dead, but rather alive. And with the rest of your life to present yourself as a sacrifice. But as D.L. Moody famously said, the problem with a living sacrifice is that it can crawl off the altar. You ever feel that way sometimes? <laughs> like, not today, Lord. I'm just kind of crawl off and hide in this corner for today. I don't want to be on the altar today. This is why this call to present your body as a living sacrifice is not a one-time commitment. The Apostle Paul said, I die daily. Every day we arm ourselves with the gospel and with the realities of the gospel. Galatians 2.20, for example, I have been crucified with Christ. So it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And now the life I live in the flesh, in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I think it's notable here again in verse 1 that Paul says it is a presentation of your bodies as a living sacrifice. You can and must worship God with your body, which would have contradicted, by the way, a heresy that was developing in the first century, the heresy of Gnosticism which taught that the immaterial, the spirit realm, could be good, but that the material, the fleshly, the body, was inherently bad. And so Gnosticism would have taught, well, you can worship God with your spirit, but the body, that's kind of the bad throwaway part of you. Paul teaches the opposite. 
He says your whole self, including your body, is meant to worship the Lord. 1 Corinthians 6 says your body is in fact a temple of the Holy Spirit. So glorify God in your body. The mouth that used to speak blasphemies and slander must now sing his praises. The eyes that used to roam with lust and envy must now study his word. The ears that used to itch for sin-enabling lies must now itch for the truth. The feet that used to run to mischief must now walk the straight path of righteousness. The hands that used to steal and strike must now work hard to serve and bless others. The brain that used to marinate in filth and lies must now meditate upon what is true and honorable and just and pure and lovely and commendable and excellent and worthy of praise. Philippians 4, 8. Present your your bodies as a living sacrifice. And this, Paul says, is your spiritual worship. Again, in the context of God's old covenant people, in the context of worship that they were instructed in, we appreciate so much that through Christ, we no longer worship by bringing those animal sacrifices to the temple because Christ is the once for all atoning sacrifice that is no longer needed. Now you and I bring ourselves as living sacrifices, worshiping Christ every day through service to him. And so everyday worship involves being a living sacrifice. Number two, we will see now in verse two that everyday worship involves not being conformed, but being transformed. When I was a kid, I had some of those transformer toys. Did you? When I think of transformation, that's the first place my mind goes, okay? And those, those things were cool. Before the TV show and the movies and all that, they were, they were just toys. And they were awesome toys. Like, how cool is it? A toy that turns from a semi-truck into Optimus Prime, right? A, a sports car that turns into Bumblebee, you know? Crime-fighting, you know, agents of good. I mean, how cool that something can transform from one direction to another. But as we know, in real life, the transformation is not always in the right direction. Here's the reality, folks. You will be changed in the course of time. The only question is, what direction will the change go? As I've known many people over the years, I have seen the transformation happen in both directions. I've seen people who start off pretty rough around the edges, but through God's grace in their lives, they grow in remarkable ways to mature manhood and womanhood, bearing the fruits of the Spirit. But I've also seen change the other direction. Sweet young people seemingly on the right track, but there's a turn and they become hardened by the world. You will either be conformed or transformed. Neutrality is not an option. And so Paul says here in verse 2, do not be conformed to this world. Now, the term underneath our English translation, the word conformed, is a fascinating term. It's from the root word schema, which in fact means pattern or even mold. Picture a plastic mold or a cake mold or whatever kind of mold you like, which fashions things according to a certain shape or design. You could literally translate Paul's words as meaning something like this. Don't get squeezed into this world's mold. This world, you could also translate it this age. There is a particular mold that characterizes our age. There are particular sinful assumptions that characterize our culture, particular values that our culture holds, particular moods, particular priorities and presuppositions that our culture holds that characterize this present age. And it used to be, apart from Christ, that we would 
inevitably follow in those ways. Ephesians 2, 1 and 2 says, you used to be dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Apart from Christ, you have no choice but to be conformed, to be squeezed into this world's mold. But in Christ, we are called to something different. Any dead fish can float downstream. It takes a living fish with intentionality and purpose and effort to swim against the culture. Just because it's popular doesn't mean it's right. Just because it's taught in most schools doesn't mean it's helpful. Just because you heard it on the news doesn't mean it's true. Just because it's available on Netflix doesn't mean you should watch it. Paul says, don't be conformed. We follow a different master now. We are not to be characterized by this age, but by the age to come. The kingdom of God, which is characterized by righteousness and peace and joy. Romans 14, 17. Don't be conformed, Paul says. Instead, verse 2 goes on, be transformed in the right direction according to Christ and his word and his ways. And this will only happen through, notice, the renewal of your mind. In other words, the direction of this transformation is from the inside out. And this is vital for us to know because I'm afraid many Christians, even well-meaning Christians, will sometimes emphasize a transformation that begins with the externals but may or may not work its way into the heart and the mind. Paul says true transformation begins internally. Let us not be guilty of what some have called fruit stapling. The Lord wants us to bear fruit, right? But it should be sincere fruit produced by an internal transformation. We are not to staple fruit onto the branches to make it appear as if the root is healthier than it is. So my wife and I have been involved the past few weeks in planting a, a, a modest garden out back and we've got some, some veggies out there and we've got some strawberries out there and, and it's especially for the kids, right? We want our kids to be able to appreciate the way that, that fruits and vegetables grow. Now, now, I want my kids to have the joy of seeing some beautiful red ripe strawberries produced on those strawberry plants. There's two ways that I could accomplish that. I could go to the store and pick up a nice carton of already ripe red strawberries. And in the middle of the night, I could staple those strawberries to the end of those branches. And my kids would come out and be like, wow, look at these amazing strawberries. But that would be fraudulent, would it not? The right way to do that is to cultivate that plant so that there may be an inside-out transformation so that fruit that is eventually born is genuine and sincere fruit. The fact is, my friend, you can learn the right Christianese to say. You can learn to wear the right clothes that most Christians expect you to wear. You can mimic Christian subculture pretty closely and still not be worshiping Christ from your heart. Jesus warned the Pharisees of this. In Matthew 23, he said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. The thing is, God does want us to clean up our lives. He does want the exterior to be pleasing to him, but the only way for that to happen in truth is to begin on the inside. The transformation starts in the mind. I love Colossians 3, 1 and 2. If then you have been raised with Christ, is that true of you? Then seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. We understand the principle of input and output, right? Like, I don't know a lot about computer science, but I know that the output of a computer is limited to the proper input that goes into the computer. 
I know that when it comes to the physical body, you will tend to grow healthy and strong by putting good food and drink within your body. The input affects the output. And yet some of us are walking around in this Christian life saying, man, I wonder why I struggle so much. I wonder why there's so much disobedience that I can't seem to deal with and I, I can't have spiritual victory. Well, what are you putting into your mind? You're spending 99% of your waking hours taking an input of this world and then maybe a touch or two during the week and you dutifully come to church on Sunday to get a little bit of the word. That's not going to be enough. You must continually set your mind upon the truth and the ways of Christ. That leads to transformation. I love how Paul describes this in 2 Corinthians 3, 18, that as we behold the glory of the Lord, we are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. It starts in the mind knowing the truth about God. And then, as verse 2 goes on to say, by testing, discerning what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. In other words, based on what we know of the will of God in the word, we skillfully apply that to various situations of life. And this is how we test and discern that good an acceptable and perfect will of God. And there's nothing better than being called to live a life of following in the good and acceptable and perfect will of the Lord. Well, now that we know what a living sacrifice is and how it is that we are to prepare our minds for everyday worship, what will that look like in real time? What would it look like for a life to be characterized every day by spiritual worship, a living sacrifice to God? Now, my plan originally was to kind of go a topical sort of direction from this point and just look at various scriptures throughout the New Testament that would characterize everyday worship. And then I realized this is the whole point of the rest of the book of Romans continuing on in chapter 12 all the way to chapter 16, what Paul does is to give specifically 10 examples of what it looks like to worship Christ every day as a living sacrifice. And yes, although I wish we had time to go carefully verse by verse through the next five chapters of Romans, we do not have time for that today. But I do want to survey these next five chapters and look at 10 sections that Paul lays out in these next five chapters to show us what everyday worship looks like. And I would summarize that, point number three, that everyday worship is a life of loving obedience. A life of loving obedience. And, and quickly now, we will survey 10 specific examples of this as we trace the rest of this letter, chapters 12 all the way through chapter 16. First, everyday worship looks like humility. This is, in fact, found in the very next verse, Romans 12, 3. Paul says, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. But this is continually the temptation, right? Especially if we have known Jesus for a while and there has been some significant growth in our life and the Lord has used us to serve and bless others and we've achieved some level of Christian maturity, we may come to the point where we we think we are all that and we forget that we would be nowhere without the undeserved mercy of God. My friend, you and I don't have anything that we did not receive from the Lord. So whatever level of growth you have, whatever level of usefulness you have for the Lord, don't be proud in that. We don't have anything that we did not receive. And when we walk in humility, we are worshiping God as a living sacrifice. The next example of everyday worship, everyday worship looks like serving others. This Paul emphasizes in chapter 12, verses 4 through 8. He summarizes in verse 6, saying, Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. 
Now, I'm not going to linger on this point because two weeks ago, Elder Bob spent a long time instructing us in the use of spiritual gifts. And if you missed that message, I commend you to go back and listen to the recording. But when you serve others with your gifts, you are worshiping God as a living sacrifice. The next example, everyday worship, looks like loving others. Seems simple, right? But not always easy. Chapter 12, verse 9 through 13 emphasizes this. Verse 10 says, love one another with brotherly affection. And wasn't Jesus the supreme example of this love? Loving us despite our faults and our failures and our idiosyncrasies, he loved us even when we were sinners and laid down his life for us. And so we are called as living sacrifices to walk in this way of love as well. This gets very specific sometimes. Notice chapter 12, verse 13. He says, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. When you do something as simple as opening up your home or coming alongside someone in a genuine, tangible need, this is a way of loving others and worshiping Christ with your life. I have been so blessed to observe here in this church this kind of tangible love. I commend you for it and for God's work in and through your lives. I think of the way that you as a church have come so quickly around the Johnston family and this need with their very young daughter and they have been overwhelmed with your support, prayer support and practical support. It is so touching and beautiful to see a church come around a need such as this. Certainly my own family has experienced this in recent months. It's an amazing thing and I commend you. You are worshiping Christ every day by showing this kind of brotherly and tangible love to those in need. When you do so, that's what it looks like to worship God as a living sacrifice. Everyday worship also looks like suffering well. Suffering well. This too is emphasized here in this section in chapter 12. Suffering well looks like trusting the Lord even in the midst of trial. Notice the phrase there in the middle of chapter 12, verse 12, be patient in tribulation. Easier said than done, right? But when we trust the Lord in a trial and suffer well in that way, what a powerful testimony of faith and worship that is. I was thinking this week about the story of Job and the setup for that story in Job chapter 1 in the divine councils where the great enemy of our souls, Satan himself, comes to accuse Job before God and essentially says, God, this man, Job, only trusts you, only fears you, only worships you because you have protected him and prospered him. But God, if you were to take away everything he has, he will curse you to your face. And I have no doubt that Job was not the first or the last human being who would be accused by the enemy in that way. So what about you? If Satan shows up in the throne room of God today, so to speak, and says, God, that person only trusts you, only fears you, only worships you because you have protected them and prospered them. But if you take away everything she has, she will curse you to your face. Would that be true of you? Some of you right now are called to a very hard road of suffering. And by faith, we are to see these moments as opportunities to worship the Lord and to present our bodies as a living sacrifice and to bring glory to his name as we trust him in the midst of a trial. Sometimes these trials will specifically look like persecution opposition from those who hate the Lord and hate when they see Christ in us. And so Paul says in those situations, suffer persecution well. Verse 14, even blessing those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse 
Some of you may experience hardship specifically from the world around you because of your obedience to Christ. Haven't we seen just these past couple weeks an example of someone standing up and saying some really basic things about the goodness of God's design in the home and in the family and experiencing great pressure from this world? Thousands of people calling for the guy's job because he simply said it's a good thing to be a wife and a mother. It's crazy, isn't it? Here we are coming upon the month of June. And depending on where you work and the spirit of your workplace, there may be great pressure upon you to conform to this age and be squeezed into that mold because it's just easier to go along and get along rather than taking a stand for Christ. But when you do, Christ is honored, even if you do get that pushback and you endure that, not with hatred, but in fact with blessing toward those who are putting the pressure on. That is your opportunity to worship God as a living sacrifice in that moment. Isn't this the road that Jesus himself walked? Isn't Jesus the supreme example of suffering well? He endured the very worst of afflictions and persecution, and he loved his enemies all the way through. He loved you and I when we were his enemies. When we are called to suffer well, we are being called to walk the footsteps of Christ and to share the fellowship of his suffering. And if our faithfulness to him puts us in the fire, we can rejoice because he is there too. And when you suffer well, enduring with faith, you are worshiping God as a living sacrifice. The next example of everyday worship is found in the beginning of chapter 13, verses 1 through 7, and that is respecting God-ordained authority. Verse 1 says, let every person, and especially Christians, be subject to the governing authorities. And we do so knowing that sometimes, even often, these human governmental authorities are wrong. That some of them are even blasphemous, as they certainly were in Paul's day. And we do know, based on the whole counsel of God, that there are times that we must disobey if we are asked to violate God's commands. Amen? But we are called to a default posture of respect and obedience to God-ordained authorities. And when we do so, that is a testimony of faith in God's providence. And it's a powerful way to stand out from this complaining world and to worship God in real time. Paul directly applies this principle of God-ordained authority in the civic governmental realm. In other places, though, and I do want to draw our attention to this because I think it's a great way to worship God every day. In other places, he, call, he applies this principle in the workplace. You can worship God by being, Monday through Friday, the best employee that you can possibly be. Paul says in Ephesians 6, 6 through 7, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man. Every day as you wake up and put on your work uniform and clock in, you have a new opportunity to worship God as a living sacrifice by being a great employee or employer by serving the Lord through the work of your hands in a way that brings glory to his name. What a powerful testimony this can be. The other day I was listening to a podcast on the story of Jim Jones. Yes, that Jim Jones, the Kool-Aid man, the, the cult leader who tragically led hundreds of people to take their own lives on a remote island. I learned for the first time that Jim Jones was not a typical religious cult leader. That in fact, when it came to religion, he was not very devout at all, but used his status as a minister to kind of manipulate people. In fact, he did not have faith in God. He was, he would say later in his life, an atheist. His was, in fact, a socialist movement. He meant to spark a socialist, even communist, revolution. That is the story of Jim Jones. Jim Jones. 
And in the course of listening to this story, the podcaster explained that back in the mid-20th century, when the socialists were, were doing their thing behind the scenes to try to come into the mainstream, they would advise their young adherents to not at first be open about their true political ideals. After all, in culture at large, at that time, these ideas were rejected and for good reason. Instead, they would advise young socialists, if you want to help the cause, what you need to do is go back to your workplace and be the best employee on your floor. Study hard, work hard, train hard so that you are competent, so that you are working with integrity, so that people are relying on you, so that your supervisor sees you as trustworthy. You be the go-to person in your workplace so that later when they find out that you are a socialist, they will say, wow, I guess this socialism thing isn't so bad because this is an amazing person to work with. Now, if socialists can do that out of spurious and deceitful motive, how much more should Christians do that through sincere and open motives? We ought to be the best, the most reliable, the most trustworthy employees in our workplaces because of the way Christ has truly transformed us. What a witness that is to our coworkers and to our supervisors. This is one example of respecting God-ordained authority in our lives. And when we have this posture, we are worshiping God as living sacrifices. The next section, the end of chapter 13 here, says that everyday worship looks like not only selfless love, as we've seen before, but as that contrasts a life of sensual lust. Notice verses 13 and 14 here at the end of chapter 13. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Remember, being a living sacrifice involves presenting your bodies to the Lord, not just presenting your best intentions. Presenting your bodies to the Lord in a way that does not allow your body to be defiled with lustful misuse. Don't be conformed to the promiscuity and sensuality of this age. We know and we bemoan the pandemic of pornography within our culture, but that pandemic of pornography unfortunately has come into the church in significant ways. Brothers, this not ought, ought not to be so. We worship Christ every day by walking in selfless love toward others, not in sensual lust. That is everyday worship. That is where the rubber meets the road. Can't claim to be a living sacrifice for the Lord, worshiping Him each day, if you have no intention to walk in purity. Everyday worship, here's another one that can be convicting, <laughs> looks like patience toward other believers. A long section here, chapter 14 and part of chapter 15, patience toward other believers who may not quite see eye to eye with you all the time. Paul says in chapter 15, verse 1, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Mature Christianity looks like learning to agree to disagree in some cases. Mature Christianity looks like wanting to love people more than wanting to be right. Now, it is true, and we must know and affirm, that there are particular doctrines of Scripture and certain ethics of Scripture which we must not compromise. I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about when the disagreements are minor, having some perspective in this and being patient toward others. And it's one thing <laughs> for a few hours on a Sunday morning to be like, all right, I'm going to be patient toward my brothers and sisters at church. That's good. But this becomes everyday worship when you go back to your home and go back to those ones loved by God in your home 
your spouse, your children, your parents, and apply this principle Monday through Saturday. Isn't this a place where we so often do fall into hypocrisy? As parents, well, oh, my adult friends, yeah, I'm patient, or at least I try to appear to be patient toward them so I can have a good reputation. And then we go home and we're chewing out our kid a half hour later. This ought not to be so. Chapter 14, 19, let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. And this is for all our relationships, including the ones at home. And when we walk in patience toward other believers, we are worshiping God as a living sacrifice. Everyday worship looks like sharing Christ with those who have not heard. A wonderful section here, chapter 15, 8 through 24. Paul says in verse 20, I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named. Now, I'm not going to linger on this point because, in fact, next week, the entire message will be devoted to the worship of witness. It's a vital way to worship Christ every day. And when you share Christ with those who have not heard, you are worshiping God as a living sacrifice. Everyday worship looks next like giving generously. At the very end of chapter 15, Paul says Macedonia and Achaia, the churches there, have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. And he invites the church at Rome to contribute as well. I was talking earlier about our employment, working hard, and we should be motivated to do that not only to be a good testimony to our coworkers and our supervisors, not only so we can provide for our family, but also so that we may have extra to share with those in need. And when we give generously to those in need, we are worshiping God as a living sacrifice. Last one, chapter 16. Everyday worship looks like drawing near to the faithful and avoiding the disruptive. Now, last week, we took some time to consider the first 16 verses of chapter 16 and this appeal to draw near to the faithful, greeting and loving one another as family in Christ. But there's a flip side to that. There are those that we are not to draw near to. Notice verse 17 of chapter 16. I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. It is a good thing to seek out unbelievers to evangelize, but it is a very different thing to walk in the counsel of the wicked and stand in the way of sinners and sit in the seat of scoffers. As important as it is to draw near to the faithful, it is equally important to avoid the disruptive, those who would turn you away from the true gospel of Jesus Christ. You say, all right, I get that, Pastor Mike. I see how important that is. But isn't that just as simple as, you know, on Sunday morning, like not going to a heretical church where they're teaching gospel-denying doctrines? Well, that's good. Yes, you absolutely should do that. But here in our information age, I believe this is a principle that must be on the forefront of our transforming minds every single day as you scroll your social media feeds. Yes, you should be going to a church on Sunday morning that teaches correct doctrine, but what about when a really compelling video comes across your Instagram feed, some preacher somewhere teaching doctrine that seems compelling because it is itching sinful ears, but it is in fact contrary to the true doctrine of Christ. As you expose yourself to input from this world, you must be on your guard to mark those who teach false doctrine and to avoid them, as Paul says. And when you do this, you are worshiping God as a living sacrifice. Everyday worship. You know, we hear those stories sometimes of the person who has led a, a shocking double life. The person who had that modest job as a plumber or a cashier, and it turns out they're like a triple agent working for like three different governments as a spy, right? And you're like, whoa, like that person was really leading a double life. Or that guy who 
His work takes him on international travel for weeks and months at a time. And eventually it comes out that he's got two families. He's got a wife and children here and another wife and other children in Brazil. And none of those families know about the other. And this guy's been leading a double life the whole way along. My friend, you and I, as people of Christ, are not to live double lives, seeming to be one type of person on Sunday morning and a very different kind of person Monday through Saturday. Every day, we are called to be living sacrifices. We owe God every moment of our lives in light of his undeserved mercy and salvation, it is our joy to worship him every day as living sacrifices. May God give us grace to do this this week, starting when we get home and all the way through Saturday evening. Father, we thank you for your gospel, your undeserved gospel of mercy and grace. We thank you, Lord, that our standing before you does not depend on our faithfulness, does not depend on our righteousness, but depends 100% upon the finished work of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for those mercies, which mean everything to us. But Lord, we also want to give of our entire selves to you. How could we do anything less knowing all that you have done for our salvation? So by your enabling grace, through the comforting and exhorting work of your spirit, lead us, Lord, in lives of everyday worship. This world needs to see examples of the genuine, and radical life change that your gospel brings. May we, Lord, be living sacrifices for your glory, and may you receive great honor through it. And we pray this in Jesus' name.